Well, Admiral, it's great to have you here, and you're the commander with the largest area of responsibility of any American military man. I'd like to ask you a little bit about that in a minute. But first, let me ask you a bit about leadership. And uh, I've always been struck, if you look at the, the Army, they have a nice little uh, short form of how they teach leadership. It's be, no do. B is understand yourself. No is understand the experience of others. And do is go out and practice and do after action review. Does the Navy have something equivalent to that? Or how would you sum up your, in a bumper sticker, how would you sum up your ways of training uh, people to be young leaders? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nye, and, and thank you for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, be no do is, is a, not a bad bumper sticker in its own right. Uh, I don't know that the Navy has an equivalent, uh, but when I was in my previous assignment as the Pacific Fleet Commander, I was uh, asked about leadership in a blog uh, interview at one point, and I coined the term credible leadership, mm -hmm. uh, and very similarly, credible leadership was uh, tr not just uh, being placed in a leadership position and a presumption that on the basis of rank or experience you're a leader, uh, but rather the underpinning of that leadership that truly uh, enables you to be credible with your subordinates, mm -hmm. with your peers, and with your superiors. And I think uh, that is uh, the ability to uh, have assimilated that experience and truly be able to put it to use. Mm -hmm. What uh, another, uh, well, it's not another service, it's essentially the Marine Corps is uh, almost part of, uh, of the Navy, but uh, uh, another branch really uh, uh, has another phrase or short form of expressing this, that, which is that officers eat last, that uh, you essentially earn the confidence of your followers by making sure that they're taken care of before you take care of yourself. What, uh, how, how would you say the Navy handles that? Uh, it's something about our Marine Corps that I greatly admire. Uh, in fact, I have often told a story of uh, the Marines that served on USS Tripoli, one of my command, uh, one of the ships that I commanded, on an occasion when, um, in very poor weather, we were uh, arriving in port after more than four months at sea, and we were putting our crew, respective crews, off the Marines uh, and the Navy sailors, and the Marines uh, lived up to that uh, mm -hmm. eat last. Mm -hmm. um, a moniker, and in fact, uh, uh, I went off with the Mew commander last uh, at the end of a very long day uh, of Liberty Call, and I was immensely impressed with the Marines caring for the youngest Marines to ensure that they were off on Liberty first. As you suggest, they uh, bed them down first, they fe or, and feed them first, and they themselves uh, take cover last and eat last. Uh, I think it's something that the, the Navy, frankly, could learn from and grow better yeah. from. The Chief of Naval Operations in 2007 uh, had a new uh, statement about uh, the role of the Navy, um, which was to combine hard and soft power. And the argument was that Admiral Stravides has also made a good deal of this. Uh, the argument was <coughs> that, yes, we're going to win our battles, we obviously have to be good at hard military power, but a lot of what the Navy is about is actually soft power. It's attracting others, and uh, whether I mean a great classic example of this was tsunami relief in the in the uh, 2004. Uh, Indonesia in 2004. Uh, but your uh, huge area of responsibility is a great place where you have to figure out how you combine hard and soft power. How do you train your people for that, to lead in that context? Yeah, thank you. That, I mean, that's a, a great question and a great issue uh, of the day. And I don't think that there's any area of responsibility that uh, demands the appropriate use of both hard and soft power more than uh, the Asia Pacific and the Pacific Command AOR. The, uh, I, th I think the best illustration right now uh, that we have is an annual event termed Pacific Partnership. Uh, USNS Mercy, one of our hospital ships, takes, takes place uh, or uh, executes this every other year and, and in between we bring <coughs> another type of platform. 
but in this we do uh, humanitarian assistance in the form of uh, engineering, medical, dental, and veterinary care. And we often exchange with uh, uh, doctors, with their counterpart, host nation doctors. We usually execute this over several months and through six or seven nations in the Asia Pacific. We've been focusing on Southeast Asia and Oceania predominantly. Um, I think, you know, in terms of training, this will make us better prepared to respond to the next disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, this has enabled us to learn to work with non-government organizations better than we had the ability to do even back in the tsunami relief days of 2004. Uh, and it's, it's uh, helped frame for us the type of uh, relief that we need to be prepared to take into a disaster. Uh, and we're not, uh, we're certainly not uh, uh, strangers to disaster in the Asia Pacific. Uh, in fact, we respond to one on the order of about every eight weeks, mm. and most recently responded to the typhoon that passed across the Philippines uh, just uh, some weeks ago. Which means your uh, forces have to know a lot more than just how to use force. <laughs> Absol absolutely, and, and again, we, get, we, we practice it but the humanitarian assistance in the form of soft power uh, really develops, I think, the skill sets mm -hmm. that the sailors, soldiers, airmen, marines can then take into an actual disaster response, mm -hmm. whether that's in the command structure of working NGO to military or whether that's in the mm -hmm. form of relief that they give the people of the host nation. I've also felt that uh, military to military contract contacts and training Foreign military is another form of soft power, but as we work with others, we can attract them. And uh, you are dealing in your area with one of the great questions of this century, the question of the rise of China. And uh, I've got a book that's coming out in a month or two called The Future of Power. It's about what role will China play and the Americans play in the world as well as in the Pacific. And the thrust of my argument is that China's going to grow. I think we'll actually stay more powerful than they. But managing the rise of China is a neat balancing act. We've got to not only be on our guard, but if we're too much on our guard and we basically create a self-fulfilling prophecy of conflict, then we're, making, we're not managing the situation well. So we you have to figure out how do you blend hard and soft power when you have a rising power. And I'm sure this has been on your mind for some time. Well, I have both responsibilities. I have the responsibility <coughs> to manage the military to military relationship mm -hmm. with China and improve it, uh, which has proven to be difficult thus far, and also to be prepared in the event uh, that uh, the ability to bring China out as a constructive partner uh, should mm -hmm. fail sometime in the future. I think, as you suggest, the military to military relationships that we uh, sustain the ability to cross-pollinate the United States military with other militaries in the region, educate them in our schools and be educated in theirs, are all elements of soft power that have proven over time to be very effective in, uh, uh, in meeting the security needs of the region, um, at least giving us elements of trust in one another that we wouldn't otherwise have. And I think exactly as you suggest, uh, we can't, it's not a foregone conclu conclusion that we have uh, the relationship with China uh, headed in one direction or another as yet, uh, but I think it's a very important balancing act to ensure that at the end of this, there's no conflict and we're constructive partners both contributing to the security of the Asia Pacific. Which makes the job of a military leader in the Pacific doubly hard because you've got two things to do simultaneously. Well, I would hope uh, that uh, we've been well trained for this, and uh, and I'll do my very best. And, and I'll also read your book with great interest, <laughs> Doctor Nye. Well, I Maybe will. it'll help me uh, in getting the balance. I'll make sure I get you a copy. But. One of the problems I've noticed is that uh, in military to military contacts, even though they're tremendously important for the reasons you've said, uh, it's one of the first things to go when tension rises. Arms sales to Taiwan. Next thing you know, the Chinese cut off mill-to-mill -mill contacts. Uh, how do you protect against that? I mean, 
a few years ago, there was a carrier visit scheduled for, I think, for Hong Kong, and the Chinese got angry about something, cut it off. How do you keep those military and military contacts going when there's the first thing to go when they're looking for a pl diplomatic signal they're trying to send? Yeah, thanks. I, we haven't been entirely successful in that. Um, after all, China gets a vote. Um, I would offer that the United States, you know, on more than one occasion, uh, has used military-to-military mm -hmm. -military contacts in the same way. Uh, we lost uh, about a decade of relationship with Indonesia as a mm -hmm. consequence yes. of, of uh, mill-to-mill ties that were suspended uh, because of the human rights abuses uh, following the, the mm -hmm. Timor-Leste uh, challenges in Indonesia. So it's something that I think uh, is an educational process, not just for the United States, uh, and given our own uh, propensity at times to do it, but for the, for the uh, uh, counterpart militaries, and the PLA is a good example. As you suggest, they've uh, shut the switch on mill-to-mill -mill ties mm -hmm. uh, frequently. And in my dialogue with them, uh, we try to not only emphasize uh, the values that we place on mill-to-mill -mill and why, uh, but also on the fact that military-to-military -military, uh, relations and dialogue extend through uh, a whole menu of items. There is mill-to-mill -mill in areas of common interest like humanitarian assistance, and then there's mill-to-mill -mill at the very high end of, you know, mm -hmm. of uh, exchanges in, in uh, principles of combat power. And in order to maintain a mill-to-mill -mill dialogue ongoing, I think it's important to select from that menu uh, the, the uh, items that we value and can, uh, can you know, broach those periods of disagreement between governments and disagreements between militaries. We think there's great value in mill-to-mill -mill dialogue being uh, a continuum. Yeah. A few years ago when I was dean of the Kennedy School, we had a program here where we brought Chinese senior colonels from the PLA and American military officers together in a two-week program to discuss basically the world. It's not that we were going to convert anybody, but we could put some scratches on their minds. The, the world looks a little different after you have human contact. Well, I appreciate uh, your doing that. I think that at the colonel level it's particularly important. Um, in my experience, uh, the People's Liberation Army is very selective about who they allow uh, foreign um, interaction with, uh, and it's a very small cadre of officers. The more often that we can br bring, you know, the general purpose forces out of the PLA uh, and into contact with their American counterparts, I think the better. Yeah. Stand yourself know is understand the experience of others and do is go out and practice and do after action review. Does the Navy have something equivalent to that or how would you sum up your, in a bumper sticker, how would you sum up your ways of training uh, people to be young leaders? Yeah, thank you Dr. Nye and, and thank you for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, be no do is, is a, not a bad bumper sticker in its own right. Uh, I don't know that the Navy has an equivalent uh, but when I was in my previous assignment as the Pacific Fleet Commander, I was uh, asked about leadership in a blog uh, interview at one point, and I coined the term credible leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, and very similarly, credible leadership was uh, tr not just uh, being placed in a leader. A little bit about that in a minute, but first let me ask you a bit about leadership. And uh, I've always been struck if you look at the the Army, they have a nice little uh, short form of how they teach leadership. It's be, no do. Be is understood. Well, Admiral, it's great to have you here, and you're the commander with the largest area of responsibility of any American military man. I'd like to 